Welcome back to 1 Corinthians 15 and we're now in the final section of the chapter which is verses 50 to 58. We're dealing with the second question that was raised earlier in the chapter. If you remember that there are two questions which are raised in this chapter. The first one says this, how are the dead raised up? Which is strangely that's the one that's being dealt with second. That's the way the apostle handles it. The first question he deals with is the second one on the list, which is, with what body do they come? So we've dealt with that in the previous recordings, the body, but we're going to see now how, how are the dead raised up? And we're going to divide that into three. Verse 50, the need for the change. Verses 51 to 54, the description of the change. And then the tremendous final section of 1 Corinthians 15 55 to 57, the celebration of the change. So this isn't the type of body, but how does it happen? Why does it need to happen is the first question that is being raised. So we're just going to read verse 50 today and it says this. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So there is the statement as to why there needs to be a change. Why it is absolutely necessary for there to be a transformation, a reconstitution of our bodies, a new body at the day and the point of resurrection. Paul says this, and this I say, and there's a great emphasis in the way he puts it now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. This is talking about those who are alive and remain. We're going to learn in the next section the description of the change. We shall not all sleep, we shall not all die, we'll come back to that. We shall all be changed. But he's now thinking in verse 50 about flesh and blood as it is in principle Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. To go back to the language of the previous section, the perishable cannot become imperishable automatically. Those who have died, corruption cannot put on incorruption, as in that there needs to be a change. There needs to be something that takes place. Now, there are changes that took place at salvation. We were legally justified, received the salvation of our soul. We have divine life. We're born again. We're partakers of the divine nature, to quote John 3 and 2 Peter chapter 1. But we need a physical change. So here he's saying here's the need for the change because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God and corruption cannot inherit in corruption, it's not an automatic thing. There needs to be the work of God that is the consequence and the result of salvation. Now, this is mentioned in other parts of Scripture. I'm thinking of uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 says this in verse 23. We ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption that is the redemption of our body. So it's talking about now being placed as sons, which is the idea of adoption, taking our place as sons, but it's thinking of a physical sense. We cannot be like our Saviour. He cannot bring many sons to glory unless there's a change that takes place. And he talks about the redemption of the body. So he purchased us by his death on the cross. He cancelled the debt. He declared us free. He liberated us. But there needs to be this act of redemption of the body. So you have redemption in terms of your soul today. First Peter chapter 1, we receive the salvation of our souls. But we need to have another thing take place to physically be in heaven and to be fitted for that. There needs to be the redemption of our body. Now Ephesians chapter 1 maybe helps us a little in this respect as well for Ephesians chapter 1 says this about the Holy Spirit in verse 14 he's the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption 
of the purchased possession. I take it that's speaking about our bodies. We've thought in uh, Romans chapter 8, we need the redemption of our bodies. And we're learning in Ephesians 1 verse 14 that we're going to experience the redemption of our of the purchased possession. What did he purchase? We're redeemed. Not with corruptible things, as silver and gold, Peter writes. We are redeemed, but that redemption covers not just the salvation of our soul, but the change in our bodies. It, it will fit us to be in heaven. Again, there's one other reference that I need to take you to in, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, and it says this, talking about the believer who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So we're being preserved, we're being kept. It's the power of God that's doing that. It's as a result of faith in Christ. And it's until that point of salvation that will be revealed in the last time. So the body, I'm just referring to what William MacDonald says in his commentary, the present body which we have is not suited to the kingdom of God in, in its eternal aspect, which will be our heavenly home. So our bodies are subject to disease, decay, decomposition, and they would not be suited for life in a state where there is, in, and is no sin, is no corruption. And so how then are the bodies of living believers going to be suited for heaven? Well, we, we're going to see that in the next set of verses. But two other verses just as we conclude this uh, little talk. In Philippians 3, which we've referred to many times over recent weeks, uh, Philippians chapter 3, it reminds us that he's going to change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So the change is going to take place. It's going to change these bodies that humiliated us so that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. But we also have an interesting passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that deals with this. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 it's, it's really the idea uh, that you have to think through to, to really understand the concept but it's the idea that you live in a body and when you die then you become uh, naked now naked not we think of nakedness in terms of the human body take your clothes off then you're naked but this is in the sense of your spirit being naked and really what he's saying in that passage is the ideal for the Christian is never to be unclothed in that sense we want to be clothed upon so he's saying most of us want the rapture to take place we want to get our new bodies in effect clothed upon with the body that's fitted uh, to be in heaven our house which is from heaven and we're groaning just now. It's a body of humiliation, which is Philippians 3, 21. But we want to be clothed upon. So there needs to be a change. And all these passages are explaining to us that either we will die and our bodies go into the grave and in a, in a spiritual sense we'll be naked. We won't be covered in a body. Or at the rapture we'll be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. And mortality will be swallowed up of life. So we'll go through the details of that in the next couple of recordings as we think about what is actually going to take place at the coming of Christ. And 2 Corinthians 5 gives us a little bit of a hint there when it says we'll be clothed upon and it's a glorious body we learn from Philippians chapter 3. So there's some wonderful things that are in the future for the believer. But as we come into this final section of 1 Corinthians 15, remember... The question that's being answered is, how are the dead raised up? And the first point is, there needs to be a change because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Thanks for watching.